Tracy gained the courage to speak to her brother once the car was on the highway. I am sorry, but you know better, Rob. He didn't respond. She could almost read his mind. He thought she was acting like a spoiled brat. Rob? She wasn't in the mood to continue the fight. Tracy needed to talk with him. Again she prodded. Rob, I thought you had died there. He finally answered. She could hear the fear in his voice. What? The answer came before she finished the question. I thought since you died in the Anatokan world, with your soul there, you went on. I would spend the rest of my life here with an empty body as a constant reminder of our fight. I shouldn't have left like that, Tracy said as she watched the speeding lines of the highway. But do you think it would be as simple as that? When he didn't answer, she looked at him. The happiness of her return was quickly siphoned away by her questions. The familiar, melancholy expression Rob normally wore slowly reemerged. It was time to change the subject. How's the latest book going? Rob didn't answer her. The silence caused her to push him for a response. You're up to the final assassination attempt, right? The one orchestrated by the ambassador? Yes, the answer was hollow and abrupt. His eyes stayed firm on the road. His thoughts were still in the possibilities tied to her death. Normally, she tried to take his mind off these worrisome details of her existence. But things were getting far too serious and on a talk. They had to think these things through, have these talks, and treasure this last time together. Tracy had to let him know. I have to go back tonight. Rob strained to keep looking at the road. Instead of asking why, he reached for the glove compartment and flicked it open. A digital recorder fell out of it and onto Tracy's lap. With one hand, she closed the glove compartment. With the other, she turned the recorder on. I was only in on a talk for four days this time. Though you said I was gone a month, it seems the time streams are diverging greatly. But that's not what's important. They've come. No one could really prepare for war. They could only prepare for possibilities and inevitable disaster. In turn, merchants and other suppliers raised their prices, wanting to die with money, as if that meant anything to a corpse. Any delusions of far-off battlefields and blood-stained grounds were vanquished from the thoughts of the Nagoyi kingdom. Even more ominous were the putrid green clouds that filled the skies, a sign that it would be more than men fighting this war. Wizards were involved. And though the people below her ivory tower attempted to act as if all was fine, they failed miserably at convincing anyone, especially themselves. I can't do anything about the clouds, Tracy said to the king's advisor and her queen, but we can't let anyone know this. It could lead to riots. Instead, I suggest the throne misinforms the public. Tell them I am allowing the clouds to remain in order to give the enemy a false sense of security. The king's advisor, Keller, nodded in agreement. But what do you think its purpose is? So we won't see them coming, she said with hesitation. When the lightning strikes, we shall have to fight. Tracy. Rob abruptly interrupted her. How many wizards are there in Anatok? Having never thought about it overly much, Tracy hesitated in answering. I honestly don't know, but I was told many of us are driven insane by our dual existence. Rob's jaw clenched. I see. Anyways, continue. Night fell soon after the conference. Alone on her balcony, Tracy stared out at the clouds. She saw beyond the mist and deep into the magic. In the magic, she saw siege towers, catapults, and thousands of men. Just as fear began creeping into Tracy, the bolts of lightning rained down and the fighting commenced. Once fully materialized, the crews attacked. Terror rained from the skies and panic flooded the streets. The cricket song was masked by the screams of the frightened, injured, and dying. No matter what Tracy tried, it still wasn't enough. For every home and family she protected, three fell at the force of the enemy. Though she managed to keep the wall between the city and their foes up, there weren't enough soldiers to man it. The siege army assaulted them continuously till dawn. Blood-red morning rays masked the blood that covered the outer rim of the city. The grieving citizens took this time to collect the bodies of the dead. During the fighting, the queen, Turla, had come to be by Tracy's side. Her eyes were shadowed with the lack of sleep and her eyes clouded with disbelief. All her fine jewels could not outshine the pain she felt for her subjects. 
Tracy wanted to take the burden off Trilla's shoulders. It was like how a child couldn't stand to see their mother cry, but just like the child, Tracy couldn't do anything about the situation. We've only ever done what we believe to be right, said Queen Trilla, breaking the silence. Sometimes, Your Majesty, what's right isn't the popular opinion, said Tracy. She knew her words held little comfort. The unofficial ceasefire didn't last long. It seemed their adversaries only stopped attacking in order to have breakfast. No one saw the next attack coming. Pardon the intrusion, your majesty, but I must speak with the lady wizard. They've poisoned our water supply. Advisor Keller rushed into the room unannounced. The pallid color of fear crept across Turla's face. What do you mean, poisoned? Bowing his head, the advisor thrust a bucket forward. Everyone who has imbibed freshly fetched water has fallen into a slumber they can't be woken from. A coma, said Tracy. Though coma was not a word from this world, they accepted the word. Leaning over the water, she inhaled deeply. Her nose picked up something the others couldn't. It is magic, an herb. I could counter this. Do it immediately, ordered Queen Churla, but Tracy had already started. Since the wall was secured by magic and the outer rim of the city was evacuated, Tracy focused on the task for two days without sleep. Part of her damned the royal family for not pushing her to become a better wizard, but she had sacrificed that in order to have a life. According to the queen, Tracy was one of the lucky ones. The wizard that waged war against them had been deprived of everything but magic training. He was an instrument to his kingdom, nothing more. The enemy employed scare tactics while waiting to move on to the next phase. Arrows rained down hourly, piercing the vacant ground and breaking against stone. Coma-inducing water rained down three times a day, leaving vermin sleeping and defenseless against the arrows. When Tracy purified the city's main well, the people rejoiced in their spirits buoyed. However, her work wasn't done. There was still the coma victim she had to cure. While the people celebrated, she remained in her tower, continuing her work. Once the enemy got word of the well, an official ceasefire was called. For the first time since the rumors of war began, the two parties met at the gate to discuss ending the hostilities. With Her Majesty Queen Trilla still by her side, Tracy momentarily abandoned her alchemy to watch the negotiations from her tower. For their own safety, the king decreed that they couldn't attend the proceedings. But the queen couldn't focus on the tiny figure. She could only see the destruction three days of battle had wrought. Magic is so destructive, said Turla. Tracy knew there was no denying it. Yes, it can be, she said. In the wake of the magical destruction, she couldn't find the words to defend her abilities. It seemed as if eternity before a messenger came bearing news. To put it simply, they want the city and the royal family dethroned. In other words, the battle continues. We'll never surrender, vowed Queen Turla. We haven't done anything wrong. The messenger shook his head. They say it's not what you have done, but what you plan to do. It's for the good of us all. Don't they see that? The queen was exasperated. Rob held up his hand, signaling her to stop for a moment. Into the crackling speaker, he said, I want three large onion rings, a cheeseburger, a chicken sandwich, and two large vanilla shakes. Your total comes to 1787. Please drive around to the first window, said a bored voice. As they pulled up to the window, he fished for his wallet. Tell me, Tracy, do you know what they are talking about? I could only guess, begrudgingly, she had to admit. The only thing they were talking about before and during the rumors of war was the peace plan. While receiving his change, he turned to her. Have they ever discussed the peace plan with you? She shook her head. I always thought it was one of those lofty goals, like justice for all and do unto others as you want done unto you crap. You were wrong, he said. Soon after the failed talks, the opposing forces recommenced their psychological warfare. But it was more than just arrows and water that filled the skies this time around. Magic was once again being used. Basic visual enhancement and ethereal magical effects filled the skies during the night. In fear, everyone shut their windows and barricaded themselves indoors. I wish I could do something about this, said Tracy, despairing over her inabilities. You'll do your part soon enough, said Turla. 
unsure of the, what the queen meant, Tracy found no comfort in those words. When Turla surrendered to sleep, Tracy stared at her sleeping figure. The queen was the closest thing to family or friends she had in this world. Though their relationship was strained by formality, Tracy deeply cared for her sovereign. That was why she hated failing the kingdom. She thought it meant that she was letting the queen down. Soon Tracy believed she could do nothing right. She was emotionally and mentally tearing herself apart. Envy drove Tracy to the window. Tracy wanted to see what a real wizard could do. She wanted more reasons to belittle herself. Tracy slipped the shutter open. The sound of the latch woke Turla, who quickly ran to Tracy's side. They both froze, staring high into the empty night sky. The queen recovered first and slammed the shutter shut, but it was too late. The image had burned itself into Tracy's mind, and though Tracy had questioned her morality, she had never feared death, not until she saw him, a wizard floating over the angry masses with powers greater and more developed than hers. She knew it was he who had summoned the army, and it was he who threatened her city. He was the enemy, and Tracy knew she was powerless to stop him. But she would die trying. Your Majesty, I beg your permission to bid my brother, the one from the other world, farewell. The words made it out, but the pain tied itself in a knot within her chest. Turla looked at Tracy and sighed, burdened by the request. I guess I can allow your wish. However, don't be long, for tomorrow we shall make them see that all of this was in vain. Tomorrow we shall win. That's pretty much it, Tracy said, clicking off the recorder. Not really. The setting sun tinted Rob's features. His eyes reflected the light, and in them she saw anger, obligation, and sadness. He wasn't telling her everything. Usually it was the other way around. Some things were just too personal or frightening to tell him. This time she had bared it all, and now he had secrets. Realizing his alienation of her, Rob offered something. You know, I get lots of letters from nut jobs, right? For the most part, they are amusing, she said, not liking where this was going. Rob smiled. You like the ones that claim I'm making some sort of political statement. Then the smile soon vanished. But the ones that claim to be part of Anna talk. Tracy finished his thought. I hate those. They don't know what it's like there. Idiots with their disturbed minds and bad dreams have no right to make such claims. I've kept some of those letters away from you, Tracy. That omission wasn't much of a surprise. I've kept a lot from you. A chill crawled down her spine. Rob? Don't ask just yet. He couldn't look at her. I'm not the one who should answer that question. Her blood began running cold with panic. Where are we going, Rob? We'll be there in ten minutes. Just give me that much longer. He wasn't asking. He was begging. Their destination was a house that was oppressed by the intangible. At the front door, she paused waiting for Rob to knock, but he didn't. He just walked into the house. The gloom from outside was heavier indoors. It seeped into Rob's voice as he called out, June, we're here. Tracy went to ask who June was, but her question was answered before she could open her mouth. At the top of the stairs appeared a woman old enough to be their mother. He's awake, she said, staring at Tracy. I'm glad you made it in time. Rob grabbed Tracy's arm and they climbed the stairs together. Though the light flowed into the house, it did nothing to help the feeling. Tracy wanted to get their business here done and leave as quickly as possible. Silently, they followed June. Oddly, Tracy could never recall doing so, but it felt as if she had taken this path before. At the end of the hall, June opened a door and they entered a room. It was a library, done in Anatokian architecture. The books on the shelves were all bound without titles, except for one shelf. That one contained Rob's books, the one about the fantasy world of Anatok. Welcome, Tracy, said a voice from her right. I'm Bastion. She turned, still reeling from the room's appearance, and faced him. He was four years older than her at best, barely considered a man by this world's standards. Time runs short, so I'll get straight to the point. He lit a cigarette before honestly starting. Outside of your city are the nine other kingdoms of Anatok, but more importantly, so is every wizard. Twenty-seven of us in all. Tracy's mind swam at the words being thrown at her. She had to stop their flow, stall them for a moment. Why, she said. Bastion looked at her like she was an idiot. 
Originally, we were just going to raise the city. The plan has changed. Now we're there to save you. From what? None of this was making sense. From your king and queen, girl. He was growing frustrated with her. Rob held up a hand and drew her attention to him. The plan for peace, Tracy. It's not what it seems. They want to end all magic and on a talk. You... Not possible. How? This was all too much. She began to shut her eyes. The stinging sensation across her cheeks snapped them wide open. Rob looked at her, hand shaking in the air, ready to strike again. There's an old Nagoyi ritual. If you kill a wizard on their 30th Anatakan birthday, under the light of the full moon in an ivory tower, their departing soul will take all the magic with it, Bastion whispered the words into her ear. Deep down, she would have preferred them screamed. He spun her around and locked eyes. She found herself swimming in them until an image not from this world surfaced. You're him. He smoothed her hair, trying to calm her. Yes, I'm the one that brought them. I'm also the one who could have come without warning and killed you all. She didn't want to trust him, but his eyes held no lies. Fear won out. No, this is a ploy. She began deluding herself. You want the city. Everyone wants more land, more power, more gold. You just want to use me. Don't, Tracy, June stepped forward. Delusions don't only hurt you, they hurt your brother. Still clinging to her denial, Tracy lashed out. Why should I believe you? June turned to Rob's published works. Because if your story had never been told, my son would only have no life here. You gave us a life together. Considering all we owe you, I think the least we can do is keep you alive. Tracy remembered the days with her parents, the loneliness. But that wasn't enough death. Mortality brought her back to her senses. What am I supposed to do? Tracy opened her eyes to find the queen staring at her intently. Good, you're back. You were almost late. What time is it? Tracy went to look out the window, but it was still shuttered. The sun has begun setting, said Queen Turla. Needing a breath of fresh air, Tracy moved to open a window, the window in the direction of Bastion. Turla quickly came between the two. Tracy's perplexed look caused Turla to speak. I don't want you upset by what's going on outside. It was time for the direct approach, decided Tracy. Why are they here? Because they don't want us to bring peace to talk, Turla said simply. Peace is a good thing, said Tracy. But how are you going to manage it? Waging a war like this seems counterproductive. Sacrifices have to be made. Bloodlust and insanity danced hand in hand within the queen's eyes, a possessive, triumphant quality reflected in her words. Before the queen could stop her, Tracy reached forward with her right hand and blasted the shutters open. I'm not paying that price. Thrusting her left hand forward, Tracy sent Turla out the window and down towards her death. Feeling compelled to watch, Tracy ran to the window, but Queen Trilla was already a bloody heap on the ground, and there was nothing to see. Soon the cries of the castle staff filled the air. They screamed for the queen, they screamed for the king, and they screamed for Keller. But none of them could answer, for it was soon apparent they were all dead. Secretly, she hated not seeing each of them die. Luckily, she didn't miss what came next. When she looked up, she saw the nine other kingdoms' forces disappear just as Bastion had promised they would. In the trample fields that surrounded the city, only one person was left. Even though he was in the distance, she saw him smiling at her. He was congratulating her, for now she was queen. Now she would guarantee this would never happen again. Grinning, she closed her eyes. She had a celebration to get to.